Yeah, for those of you who I have not yet met, I've been doing massage for a little over 14 years. And the title of this talk is Grace in Every Step, um, Reclaiming Our Natural Human Gait, or Pain Relief, Stress Relief, and Pleasure. These are the three things that generally bring people to me and get them on my table. And uh, I did my training in Boulder, Colorado, where we had a pretty high percentage of runners in that town. They were really careful to teach me techniques on how to work on broken runner bodies. Um, the basic gist of what I was taught in school is that the human body is not really built for running. That this shock wave that happens when we strike the ground damages tissues all the way up. Um, they taught me how to work on plantar fasciitis, which, as Dr. Hughes knows, is mostly plantar fasciosis. That's a subject for another day. A lot of knee pain, ITB issues hip pain and low back pain and as my pro progress in my career went on and I worked on a lot of runners I was noticing the same problems were happening in people who didn't run at all. Um, most disturbingly me. I uh, wasn't running. I had the right shoes. I had the New Balance nursing shoes. I had the super feet orthotic insoles. I had all the technology I could get. But I was working all day on stone floors, and I was in chronic pain. I had the good fortune of working on a guy who convinced me to look into another method, which was to take off my shoes and stop beating my feet in the ground. So this talk is to give you guys an idea of some of what I learned in that process. Mm -hmm. Six months after I met this guy, I was working on the same stone floors in shoes with no padding, no arch support, mm -hmm. and I had no pain in my feet and my knees. So, I'm going to take you first into your brain to talk about our senses. Um, we take for granted sight, smell, taste, hearing, touch. What am I missing? Smell. 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 Proprioception. Your sixth sense. Your proprioception. This is the one that allows you to brush your teeth without sticking yourself in the <laughs> eye. Um, this is the one that allows you to catch a medicine ball and not slam into the wall behind you. This is the one that allows you to pass a sobriety test. Walking in a straight line. Hopefully none of us ever have to do this in front of a police officer, but the idea is that proprioception is one that we're starting to learn more about. Obviously we've always had it, or we wouldn't be here now. Um, David Eagleman wrote a great book called Incognito, it's on Secret Fives of the Brain. It talks about what goes on under the hood here. And most of what happens in our brain, we don't know anything about it. And he describes our consciousness as a small raft riding along on a sea of neurological activity. Um, he discussed this case of a, a man who couldn't see, and they did this landmark surgery where they wired him up and it was going to be a big deal. They were going to have news cameras. This guy was going to see his son's face for the first time. He took off the bandages and he couldn't see. And he took lots of tests. Everything was hooked up. The problem was his brain didn't know how to translate this raging river of neuro neurological information coming from his eyes. It was like he was trying to drink from a fire hose. It was just too much. It took the guy three years but he learned how to see. And what I want to teach you tonight is how to see with your feet. Um, picture yourself in a garden, and a friend of yours goes, hey, think fast, and they toss you a brick. And you catch the brick. And by the time you can think about it, you've already set the brick down and you're dusting your hands off, and what was that about? The point is, there's no thought here. This is automatic. A lifetime of experience has taught your hands what to do. When your, your ears hear it, your eyes see it, you catch it. I'm pretty sure there's no one in this room who would punch a brick. Now, you don't have to be a professional juggler to catch a brick. If you are a professional juggler, you can juggle bricks, and have a conversation, no big deal. There are people on earth right now who have that kind of professional juggler wisdom in their feet. I like to think of the African lady with a basket on her head. Maybe a little baby strapped to her back. She has this 
fluid, graceful stride. Every step of her entire life, from the time she learned to walk, her brain has received a nice, strong signal from one of the most highly innervated parts of her body. And our feet actually have more sensory neurons than our hands. Anyone with kids knows this because you step on a Lego in the middle of the night and you get a really <laughs> strong signal. Even if you don't have kids, you step on a dirty floor in your kitchen and you're like, Sam, what was that? You can feel it. It works. It's hooked up. Yeah. Turns out this lady's not alone. There's somewhere around one and a half to two billion people on the earth right now who've never worn a pair of shoes. And friends of mine have been on mission trips around the world, people who've traveled to exotic locations that I would probably never be, told me that there's a universal thing here. No matter where you are, regardless of religion, ethnicity, culture, man, woman, child, they all walk like this lady. Maybe not exactly, but they all have a fluid, graceful, gentle stride. Their feet are catching the bricks and releasing them every step. Now, you guys and this guy have done something far more amazing than carrying 40 pounds of groceries on our head. We have managed to walk around in the same tall, lanky body while blindfolding the most sensitive part of our body. So that raging river of neurological information gets cut down to a trickle. And our brains are adaptable. They deal with it. There's no info. All right, we'll fix it. We find a way to get that proprioception. And that way is pounding. We thump the floor. And our current model to solve this is what I call the helmet model of footwear. Dan talked about it. It's probably the Brooks Beast. I think that was the shoe I was running in last <laughs> week. Um, oh, like a whole long list of awesome technology to protect us from this impact. And to me, this helmet model of footwear, it's like you have a friend who's like, man, my neck's killing me, I got a splitting headache. And you go, what are you doing? And they're like, well, I hit my head against the wall all day. <laughs> you go, man, you should get a new helmet. They've got some really good ones now. It's like gel, or air pack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm suggesting that perhaps we stop building a better helmet and look at how we walk. So we've established our problem. We've established our solution. It's easy. Just learn how to walk. Stop punching the bricks with your feet. No problem. The problem is we're really wired now. It's easy. Just do this. Yeah. Just, just be like my kid and you got it. No problem. End of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Just like that. Learn from the master. What a team. Um, so, the exercise that I'm proposing is uh, basically your sobriety test. I want you to start barefoot. It's not as scary as it sounds. You can be inside on a nice clean floor. You can sweep first if you want. Stand tall and relaxed. And gently shift your weight from foot to foot. What we're going to do is teach our brain to see with our feet. And this is something I did every morning for quite a while when I was learning this gate again. Every morning when I go dump my coffee down until I step outside. A little cold concrete. That was a new sensation. New colors. New things. Eventually it becomes normal. Once you're used to this just gentle shifting of weight, bring one foot forward and gently pour your weight onto it. This is an exercise in ease, not effort. It's not hard work. It's not going to hurt you. But what it'll do, if we do this as a daily practice, we'll start teaching our brain to see through our feet. For people who have trouble not thumping, if they do this backwards, they'll find it's just impossible to thump. Because when your eyes aren't telling you where you're going, you have to listen to your feet. To get rid of the pounding, the pain tends to fix itself. I can barely hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. And turn the air off. Oh, okay. 
When we get rid of the pounding, the pain goes away. I'm not saying it's going to cure everything, but it gets rid of a lot of the problems. I don't think of this as runner's hip anymore. I just think of it as shoe hip. When we stimulate our brain, when we feed this hungry part of our brain, it's not been getting information. Anyone who's had a foot massage knows this is a very relaxing thing. When we get our feet out and get some stuff going, our brain goes, oh yeah, I can see. This is good. Sure, life is going to have stress, but this is a free meditative thing that can really help. And finally, pleasure. And this is the dangerous one. Because it does feel good. And as you start experimenting with different surfaces and walking outside, you run the danger of unleashing what I call the happy little kid, first day of summer vacation, wild animal joy. <laughs> and it's good, but it can be too good. And this is what leads people to becoming barefoot runners overnight, getting stress fractures, and getting Achilles tendon problems. And there are a lot of good books out there on barefoot running. I encourage you to read some. I've got some written down here, but uh, before you take off running, teach your brain how to see. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Moses, my, my feet have a little bit of an ego, and like I try to practice when I'm on the beach every year, and when I'm walking down the pavement, mm -hmm. and I hit a stone, go begging for shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get around that one. Um, yeah, if you're used to a smooth surface, and you step on a stone, it hurts. But that's because we still have this tension in our feet, because our feet still can't see. When I started this simple exercise three and a half years ago, one of the things I did once I started getting used to the gentle walking was I stood in my gravel parking lot. Just standing on it was nasty. It was like, oh, oh, oh. And I just stood there for a while and I was like, all right, okay, I can do this. And eventually my feet quit freaking out and quit fighting, and they got soft. And just like you can catch a lumpy, sharp, dirty brick in your hands, <laughs> even though your hands are soft. I mean, my, I got baby hands. I massage people. I have no calluses. I can catch a rock. I can catch a piece of firewood. My feet are much tougher than my hands. They're made for it. They're made for walking. They've just forgotten how. And with a little time, you get that reaction to when you step on something hard, the foot doesn't tense up. It gives. Yes. I did a 56 foot firewall. Mm -hmm. And I'm still looking for how that actually happened because I didn't get burned. Red hot coals. I have no idea. <laughs> I've never done a firewall. I've been going barefoot every day for almost three and a half years. Hot pavement is still hot. I don't, I, I really I, I don't know the whole coal walking thing. I don't know. I don't know either. All I know is that I stood there along with a lot of other people, and one after another, we went down that feet, and it was 56 feet. I helped dig the trench, built the fire, those coals were red hot. I stood there, took a deep breath, and believed that I could get to the other side without burning my feet. And when I got to the other side, my feet were not burned. I've thought about this one a lot. I've never had the desire to do it myself, but I know people have done it. And I have one of two theories. That's why I'm interested in here. A, it's a miracle. <laughs> I heard that one. <laughs> um, B, it's probably a light and frost effect. Kind of like the way hot water will dance on a griddle and it'll boil and bubble and kind of bounce. Right. That your, your nerves are going on, going on soft coals. So your feet get hot and sweaty. And the sweat on your feet might even boil a little or cool the coals as you step across it. But again, I'm just speculating. No, no, no. I, I appreciate that perspective because, you know, I've run a few of my own theories through my yeah. head, you know, about asking. that. But asking I totally you. get what you're talking about up there. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, you know, I grew up on a little farm and we wore, all the, we wore no shoes for most of the year. Right. Because and at that right. point when I came into the world in a way that you wore shoes all the time, I felt I did not like it. It's like prison. Yeah, I didn't like it. And I still have the tendency as much as possible to take my shoes off under a lot of different circumstances. And it, it seems to be some 
in, in uh, intellect something. You know, I was going back to your little comment about the uh, reaction, mm -hmm. and it does seem like that we have this innate, almost genetically programmed part of our beingness that has that kind of, even a small child, a very small children, if you do this, they'll blink their eyes and that sort of thing, that uh, totally is available. And you, you're saying, yeah, let it happen, is what I'm hearing. Yeah. yeah. If it hurts, don't do it. <laughs> well, you have a lot of uh, kind of public opinion about there too. This is dirt. Here we are in a medical practice, mm -hmm. and Mike or Anita walk around barefoot or anything. But I've had pa pa patients that have said, hey, you can't really run walk So we have a policy that when patients are here, we kind of keep our shoes on. <laughs> so I'm trying to remember that, so I don't get myself you know, in trouble. How do you overcome this, this, this cleanliness misconception that, that people have? I mean, Daniel Howell has a book called The Barefoot Book, and he discusses that. I think that's one of the first things he talks about in the book is this myth of the dirtiness of bare feet. And one, I think he's the one who said, feet don't stink in Western shoes. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the bacteria count in shoes is way up there. It's the perfect place to read all kinds of nasty stuff. It's warm, it's moist, it's dark, it's, it's filthy. But dirt? It's just dirt. Yeah. Does he address though what happens in the brain? Because I grew up like you, and when I went to college, I started wearing shoes, and I haven't taken my shoes off since college. And I'm trying. Neva, Neva took us. She walked up the mountain with no shoes, and she said, "Take your shoes off." I said, up, up a gravel road. Oh. <laughs> I would have been dancing like you did on gravel first time. For miles. The entire way. I grew up going barefoot all the time. But the brain, my For brain sure. now says. I don't want my feet to be dirty because then my house gets dirty, my shoes get dirty, my car gets dirty. <laughs> well, you can ask my kids. We have a boot scrubber in our back door. You know, like you can buy at a farm supply store for getting the muck off your boots. But it's our foot scrubber. <laughs> <laughs> when we get when we go to the back door and brush the dirt off your feet, and then you brush it off yeah. the mat, and then you have the third mat, and by eventually by the time you get it, foot washing station. Yeah, you know, yeah, that was. Gonna be in the summer, we have a foot washing yeah. bucket because yeah. you know, you're coming about your practice and public opinion and that sort of thing. You know the first thing that popped in my head is what's above your feet. Well, and you know what I'm saying? And I, have, words, I that, have no need for the opinion of others. I mean, but I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that, that probably the thing that's going to change the culture around that is actually seeing people without their shoes yeah. and seeing a whole being and realizing, you know what I'm saying? And that, yeah. That yeah. is one of the perceptions, you know, we think, you know, the mainstream cultural perception of barefoot is you're either homeless and crazy, <laughs> or <laughs> <in> Nashville, <laughs> Nashville. <laughs> which by the way, we have a law that protects barefoot people, and we say, oh, cool. so, or you're a hippie, or both, <laughs> and that's pretty much where, where it ends. And, and to me, it's, it's more like a biology geek thing than a hippie thing. <laughs> it's, you know, I'll, I'll admit to being a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, but it's, this, was, this was a story when this guy told me this. It clicked right away. I was like, yeah, I remember this. I went barefoot for two years in college. Mm -hmm. And it was great. I didn't have any trouble. As a matter of fact, I didn't really have trouble, ironically, until I went to massage school and they said, man, you got to get some decent running shoes and your gait's all messed up. You don't get, have a good heel strike, you have these funny little strides. <laughs> I, used to hike, I used to hike 14 years in flip-flops. You know what I'm saying? How is the bottom of a shoe any cleaner than the bottom of a foot? It's not. It, you know, you're walking through everything and then you're carrying it in and it's not any cleaner. Well, it, but people are like, oh, you're going to get a disease. I mean. I don't know. There's flesh eating bacteria. Right. There's a there's this guy they call him the Barefoot Sensei, um, Nick Dodge, I believe is his name. And, and I like what he says. The first thing that happens when you take off your shoes is you start paying attention. And you know, because I have friends like, aren't you afraid to go step on something? I was like, I step on something every step, but I'm pretty aware of what it is. 
people are like, oh, do you run in grass? I was like, that's one of the few places I actually don't run because grass can hide things like bees and thorns and broken glass, and those I don't want to step on. I like to run where I can, oh, wherever I see them, but like that. Like you step on a thorn. Is that pulling out? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah, okay. That's yeah, really nice. Okay. <laughs> and, but that's the thing is now that my feet can see, I do step on thorns and I, I stop before it gets in the skin. It's like my foot just goes, whoa. Uh, I step somewhere else. And if you're running, once this is all wired, right? And you step on a thorn, you're going so fast, you kind of lift up a foot and you catch on the next foot. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. From, yeah, your knee bends. Yeah, it's, it gives way. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like if that brick's too heavy, you set it down, you know, mm -hmm. fight it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I got my first pair of bike runs, I would do trail running, and there'd be like sections that were that were gravel, like towards the beginning of the trail. And it was actually really exciting because I could feel my feet shifting every time I land on different patches of gravel. Like my feet just took care of me, it never hurt. I never tripped on anything. Like my feet just responded to what was directly underneath them at that moment. And the Vibrams or Vibrams or Five Fingers, they're kind of, I think, you know, if a regular shoe is a blindfold for your foot, they're more like sunglasses. It's like they let some of that information. Mm -hmm. And Robin and Marty have a great naturalfootgear.com. It's a great website that has a lot of other non-freaky looking foot healthy options. <laughs> um, that have that similar approach of letting your foot function as it should. But the danger, I think, of the five fingers is they can trigger that same happy little kid thing. My dad, I gave him a pair for his 67th birthday. Um, he had really severe hammer toe. He had been diagnosed with shark and Ritu syndrome, so he had this atrophy of his nerves. His toes were curled up, and he had skinny little calves and really high arches. And he told me that the two options presented to him were basically surgery A or surgery B. Neither one did he really like the idea of. Um, but I convinced him to wear these funny looking shoes for an hour a day. Three weeks later, I get this call. He's like, man, I feel like a wood sprite. I just went for a run in the woods. I haven't run 30 years out my back already. This is awesome. And I was like, yeah, I might want to hold off on that. <laughs> And you know, a little while later, he calls, is it normal to have a really sharp pain in the top of your foot? And I'm like, yeah, I think that's normal when you have a stress fracture. Yeah. I don't want to hold off on the running. But he, he kept wearing the shoes, and he got to the point where he, he wouldn't wear anything else. Um, eight months later, his hammer toe was on. He had perfectly normal toes and less than a year. No surgery. That's all he's worn for three and a half years now. It's pretty amazing to I had a, a friend who passed now who uh, fell prey to Guillaume Barre. I have no idea what that is. Guillaume Barre is a virus that attacks the nerve system and it starts in the feet mm -hmm. and works its way up until eventually it gets to an organ that won't, you can't live without it. <clears throat> and uh, he was like 82 years old at that time, walked two or three miles a day, really in good shape. and. Um, now I got to be part of his healing of actually coming back and coming through that and all of the physical therapy that went along with it. It was pretty miraculous in a way. Um, but what I got out of that was is that, yeah, my feet, um, I am totally dependent on my feet for balance. And... Um, you practice yoga, right? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, when Kelly introduced me to yoga, um, she could barely touch my feet, right? She could barely touch my feet. That's how locked up they were, tight they were. They were atrophied. They were atrophied. You know, I'm 67, you know, and it was uh, three years ago when that started, three and a half years ago. And when I started doing yoga and all of the balance stuff that what I did in yoga and all that kind of stuff, I really got my feet back. I really started getting my feet back. And so, um, your talk is very inspiring and helps me understand that, but it also makes me appreciate the value in yoga. Absolutely. And, and you, I do it with no shoes on, so it really, um, That's I inhabit my feet when, I, when I'm doing yoga. I definitely inhabit my feet more than I have. That's one of the things I say to people, you know, there are a lot of people who do yoga, but the idea of walking and running 
without shoes freaks them out, right? Well, imagine doing, you know, standing yeah, one leg balance on. pose in hiking boots. It just, you don't <laughs> have them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, it I doesn't heard, make sense at all. Yeah, I hear that too. But you know, it's like water. 22 degrees here and, you know, I mean, there there are times when I really want to be able to put my shoes on. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and my shoes and absolutely. I use my shoes, I'm but I need to, to open that other door a little bit more too. Yeah, and I'm not trying to talk okay. anybody about barefoot all the time. Just teasing. But the good thing is, like, thanks to Robin and Marty mm -hmm. and the Vibrams and a few other growing, small but growing yeah. number of options, yeah. you can still wear shoes and not have them be foot coffins. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know. I think I wear some of those barefoot Yeah, I think we have a friend. Yeah, we have a friend. Survival is the best of though. And that's the other thing I notice is that when I do get a pair of shoes, when they become totally non functional, mm -hmm. that's when they're comfortable. That's when I like them most. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I wear a pair of shoes and put my feet are practically touching the soil, and then I get a new pair and they go, dang, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I just wore those shoes out. It's like, wait a minute. Well, these ones here, I've had for three and a half years, and they've worn almost halfway through the four millimeter sole, and they've got just as much structure as they had on day one. You walk lightly, you light lightly on the yeah. earth, obviously. Well, that and I take them off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure if I keep them on a shelf, it'll last forever. <laughs> but, but you know, that being said, they're. Most days, at some point in the day, I do put on shoes, especially in the winter. I'm glad to hear you talk about your day because I've been intrigued by those things for a long time and I want to get a pair. And I'm glad to hear that they're available and mostly to actually bridle and heal that part of me that would be probably be like your dad. It's like I'd be suddenly ready to hurt myself. You yeah, know, you, you, you got to watch out for this guy. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. it, it is so much fun. Yeah. And, Ken Bob is another like barefoot running guru. He's, his big thing is have fun, but not too much. Yeah, yeah. Mo, I don't know if uh, you or or uh, Robin or somebody can answer this, but and you may want to draw this up there. But the the diagram of the angle of the toe. I'm sorry, the angle. Oh yeah. How long does that take to shift? So the angle of what? Excuse my cave painting here. Waterworld. That, that's kind of that's kind of like my choice now. Um, yeah. And Ray McClanahan has some great YouTube videos about this as well. And that's what the product Correct Toes is about: is is repairing for the foot to its natural shape. That ideally, the widest part of your foot is the toes, not the ball of the foot. Um, this is one example of a shoe that pretty much fits that shape. And the toes are the widest part. And that was honestly why I bought these. I had no intention of becoming a barefoot runner or running in them even. I just took a hike in them and it clicked and it took yeah. off. And I got hurt and learned along the way. But you know, your standard shoe shape these days is what I call the foot coffin. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. narrower at the tip, widest at the ball, narrow at the heel. And the problem is, yeah. you know, what Dan was alluding to is it, it displaces mm, that first toe laterally. So it's... Want an example shoe? Yes. <laughs> foot coffin. Yes. Well, actually, your boys have like, a really good example of, you know, what oh. our feet look like, especially before they've been... So yeah. <laughs> well, this is pretty much almost everything you could ask for in foot Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You also have an elevator <laughs> You wore so, them on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a little difference there. This is basically what your foot would like to be shaped like, although maybe not that big. And this is what <laughs> fashion would like your foot to pretend it's shaped like, which we also have this factor. Um, I don't want to go too much into shoe structure and, and the nightmares created by it, but what Dan was talking about is when you displace this first toe, which is obviously the thickest, strongest toe in the foot, you throw off the whole biomechanics. And that's probably a whole other night's worth of subject material right there. But you're also throwing off the sesamoid bones laterally underneath that joint. You know, in a normal, natural gait, 
at the end of the stride, you don't really push off, but there's, there's some force exerted there as you transfer weight. And if the toe is in its natural alignment, well, we're getting all techy here and my drawing skills are not up to par. Um, if you're starting with your foot in the natural shape, which is gigantic and ugly here, <laughs> if that great toe is in alignment with that first metatarsal, the sesamoid bones are under this metatarsal phalangeal joint, and everything works beautifully. As soon as your foot coffins, excuse me, your, your stylus shoes, push your toe laterally, the sesamoid bones get pushed over, and all that force ends up falling off medially, and, and that medial arch of the foot, or longitudinal medial arch, collapses. Um, three and a half years ago, I had minor bunions and kind of fallen arches, and hence all the arch support. But I now kind of agree with the concept that arch support builds your arch like putting your arm in a sling builds your bicep. You're creating the position, but you're turning off all the mechanisms that make it happen. Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to say there's no use for arch support, especially if you're used to it. You, know, you can't go cold turkey, especially if you're on your feet all day and you're used to this support. Start with the baby steps. Now, can you shift that as an adult? Can you shift that bone mm -hmm. or that toe back to... I did. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm an adult. Was that just my bare Because I've got bunions too. I stopped wearing any shoe to push my toes together. The first day I tried these things on, I mean, I've always hated shoes. That's why I went barefoot for two years in college. Partly because I have a genetically very wide foot, and it's really hard to find shoes that fit me. I mean, even within the spectrum of so-called barefoot shoes, there's not much that fits my feet. And the first time I tried these on at REI, I stuck my foot in there, and it was like a little angel went, you never have to wear shoes again. And I was like, I won't. I got down the... the to the register, and the lady at the register is like, you know, she opens a box and saw that my shoes I'd worn in, in the box. And uh, she's like, does it feel weird having that stuff between the toes? And I was like, oh, it feels right. Mm -hmm. Because for my feet, it was like a, a breath of fresh air. They were, mm -hmm. toes are, they should be a school of fish, not a can of sardines. <laughs> you know, that, that yoga thing, remember those things on that yoga you know, toes? That device yeah, that you stick uh -huh. between your toes? It just was amazing uh, because I, what I experienced too is not only does the left, not only yeah, does the first it is not only does the, the big toe go this way, but if the shoes are narrow, all the toes start mm -hmm. falling in. So what happens is that mm -hmm. you know you get the little toe crossing the toe that's next to it, but everything's getting squeezed across the entire. Yeah. So when I put those things in the first time, it was a lot, wasn't it? It was not. It was not comfortable at all, and I think. You know, I think it is possible that if I were to uh, wear this thing more like at night or something like that and pay attention to open toe shoes and and uh, do the spreads in yoga, you know, how you spread your toes and stuff in yoga, I think in a, uh, some period of time, I think it would improve. Yeah, but see, that's the trick. It's, it's not just spreading them, but stop pushing them together. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, yeah. Danielle was talking about, you know, she gets done teaching a yoga class, it's like, she's taught these people how to root down, spread the four corners of their feet, spread their toes, do their asana, they're balanced, they're coordinated, it's easy. It's everything's like stacked up, <laughs> and then they get off their mat and they bump across the floor, <laughs> and they go put on their fancy, pointy rocket shoes that are, you know, full of all kinds of, uh, you know, rebound technology that are smooshing the toes together, blindfolding that sensation, and supporting their collapsing arch. Can I ask what is the proper way to step if it's not pounding on the heel? Or not pounding, but how do you moderate that? That's, that that's what that exercise is. Weight shift. Um, start with just place, well, you bring this to, up the subject of heel strike versus forefoot strike, which is a big thing in the running community right, right now. And I think we should strike strike from our vocabulary. It's kind of like saying, which part of the hand is best to punch that brick with? Do I want to nail it with the heel of my hand, or do I want to punch it with my knuckles? It's, let the whole foot 
take that weight together. And your foot will tell you what feels good. Um, the trick is, if we're used to walking, you know, like the little Lego toys, mm -hmm. or the, the keep on trucking guy, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's ingrained in us to do that from, from pattern to pattern. And that's why I like this, this sobriety test exercise of going very slowly to just placing the foot. So you're pretty much putting it flat on. Pretty much flat on. I think. So smaller strides, huh? Very small. For this oh. exercise, you, you're not reaching. So you're, what about you're just your normal placing gait? Your foot. Should, should you try to shorten your gait? Yes. From your normal gait? Yes. It'll feel like you're taking very small steps. And you know, in the circle of people talking about gait repatterning, they refer to our, our shod walking as um, overstriding. Right, because our brain's looking for that input, it's creating this longer stride where not only are we slamming the heel, but to get that slam, we're pushing off from the other foot too. So there's a lot of stress on both ends of each step. And so it's a much shorter stride. And at first you're gonna to have to walk really slowly and it's gonna feel really weird. I like my long stride. You do, honey. Oh, <laughs> and you know, we, like, I'm so always efficient. behind him when he gets out of the so car. Much, so, much of, so much of our identity is wrapped up in how we walk. Yeah. You know, yeah. years ago when my sweet wife was like, honey, you know, maybe you just shouldn't walk so hard. Mm -hmm. Because I was complaining about my feet and my knees killing me. And, and you know, she said I sound like an elephant coming through the house. Thump, thump. And I'd be like, that's just the way I walk. Leave me alone, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, we, and we have this like, oh, a spring in your step, right? You're lively, you have a spring in your step. That spring is, there's something on the other end of that spring and it's a pound. And, and I see people running now in their minimalist shoes and it's like, they've got the part that you don't slam your heel in the ground. So they're running on the forefoot, but they're, they're bouncing. They're still bouncing. It's like they're jumping rope. And, and they're transferring all that energy instead of being a slam up through the skeleton. They're, they're putting it into the foot and into the Achilles tendon and into the calves, and it's still this muscular effort that's probably giving them a heck of a workout. <laughs> and, and breaking down the tissues of their foot and their Achilles tendon, and, and those are the people who, a month from now, will be like, yeah, I tried the minimalist barefoot thing, it's not for me, I'm going back to my foot confidence. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't want to tell people how to run. Mm -hmm. But it hurts me to see it. Yeah. 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 You know, so it's uh, you really raise my consciousness about that thumping, how heavy I walk. The way the candlesticks fall off the furniture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're living. In, we're Literally. Living, we're living in all. Yeah, yeah, we, more big listen, minutes. listen. She rattles it pretty good too. But yeah. I'm telling you, we live in this old farmhouse, and the foundation is not real firm. <laughs> in fact, we think it's like a trampoline sometimes. Uh -huh. But it, you just raised my consciousness because of that. What you just described is a good indication, a barometer. The hardwood floor is a, is yeah. a good place to do this because you'll, yeah. you'll hear that thump. Yeah, it's absolutely. And the other thing I wanted to share was there was a period of time when I lived with indigenous people in a situation that was hostile. And we had all of this gear and all of this shoe wear. And I was always amazed at how they could move, because they were barefooted, how they could move through the woods without making any noise. You know? And they and they would try to communicate to us to take our shoes off. That was, I mean, what you're saying is so true about the desensitization of the brain in relation to... And we, uh, we can learn that. Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, I'd be surprised if our military isn't already getting on this. Because I had my proudest running moment ever. It was about a year and a half after I started this journey. I was out running a trail on Warren Wilson. And uh, I had to jump over a rabbit. <laughs> it didn't hear me coming. Came around the corner, and it darted, it darted out from under me as I was jumping over it. It surprised both of us, but that's when I was like, I'm getting this thing. Yeah. I just snuck up on a rabbit yeah. while running. Yeah, yeah. Well, ninjas now, wear toe shoes. It, well, that was, what's that? Ninjas wear toe shoes. Yeah. Well, I was actually barefoot this day because I didn't expect to go running. I had some 99 cent flip flops. I just got off work. It was a nice spring day. I called home. I was like, honey, can I go for a quick run? She's like, yeah. 
I rolled up my jeans. So I was yeah, like, yeah. the people on the trail, that definitely fit their crazy man. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Crazy man. What? Great. So back to bunions for a second. I, I do go barefoot a lot, and I, I wear a lot of flat shoes and not, and I have really wide feet. Mm -hmm. So I wear really wide shoes. I don't really bind my feet. But, um, I do have bunions, and my grandmother had bunions. So uh -huh. part of that is genetic, right? Um, I don't know. But because I've never worn high heels and pointy toe shoes, because pointy toe shoes just Honestly, don't fit feet, my feet. Your feet look a lot better than most of the feet I see on a day-to-day -day basis. There's no genetic aspect to it. There's no genetic? Well, yeah, I was going to say, that theory. Yeah, no, I was going to say, genetic theory. Oh, that's one of the Shot things. Shot theory, doesn't Well, my grandmother had bunions. You know, the, the unshod masses of the world, right? The, yeah, they don't billion. have bunions. Apparently, very, very low incidence. It's not never, but it's almost unheard of. And and I think I would venture a guess that it, the people who do have them are probably people who are wearing flip flops because you have to like kind of squeeze them with your oh, nose. Oh, I wear flip flops a lot. You know, or I, I have in my life. I did too, and that was a lot. When I stopped wearing flip flops all the time, I noticed this second toe was getting a blister when I go running barefoot because it had a habit of holding those flip flops on every step. Oh. It was used to grabbing the shoes. So I had to oh. learn how to stop grabbing. Oh. Yeah. And like let the toes relax and let them Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And awesome. and now when I wear my flip flops that I used to love, they feel like cinder blocks on my feet. Bunions bunions don't hurt them when you don't have shoes on them, or do they? They don't ever hurt. Since I've I have been doing yeah. yoga for years. My bunions don't bother That's me That's kind of what my feet looked like three and a half years ago. Yeah. Ooh. You know, I think yeah. you have a genetically wide foot like I do, so you yeah. have pretty limited options. For yeah, shoes. and I don't think those things would fit up my feet. I, I mean, my big toe is so big, I don't think I could get it in that. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, little glove. The, yeah. There are some options, and I would encourage you to talk to Robin and Marty about what some of those mm -hmm. options are. And there's a whole cultural thing about what's a beautiful foot. Right. Like, you know, maybe a lot of shoe wears marketing is really about hiding your feet or putting something sure, on your feet. Sure, dainty. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of <laughs> joke that. I say the difference between uh, Chinese foot binding mm -hmm. and fashion footwear is just a matter of technology. <laughs> yeah. It's the same concept, trying to make your foot look dainty and tiny. Mm -hmm. Yes, madam. Have you ever seen these shoes that are like um, sandals without the bottom? No, yeah. Yeah, the Maui like, snow boots, I think you're on No, the they're like the, they're, they're just um, a thong for your foot that goes the between your toes and yeah, it just goes in the top and there's no bottom to the shoes. You're foot so, naked on so the like, oh, so, so you can trick yeah. people into Maybe thinking you're wearing shoes. That's the idea. It's a good yeah. way to make a lot of money without a soul. That's like your... <laughs> <laughs> Like you're tipping your hat off to the cultural <laughs> tradition of wearing a shoe, but saying, I choose to have my foot there. <laughs> That's awesome. I like that. So, yeah, yeah here's, here's a good example of a healthy, normal human foot. <laughs> yeah. Widest at the toes. Yeah. Nice foot, dude. Dude, yeah. Good foot. Well, here's, a, here's another one. <laughs> or another two. <laughs> oh yeah, nice, nice feet. These are my teachers. 